So in this case, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is the golden volcano. <laughs> and what is the lava? His unlimited manifestations of, of Krishna Prem, Unna to Ujvala Prem Ras of Shimati Radhika, just flowing and flowing. So if, what was it, a couple of years ago when on Big Island the volcano kept on going off for like days and weeks, right? It didn't yeah. stop. <laughs> so Mahaprabhu is like this golden volcano with all these symptoms, especially in Antya Lila of Chaitan Charitamrita. How Mahaprabhu was always constantly manifesting these, you know, completely astonishing, mm -hmm. superhuman, even Gurudev referred to them, beyond human. Uh, that's why he said there's a little bit of Aishwarya <laughs> in Maha. Because when Krishna doesn't show any superhuman, he's just like that, coward boy. But Mahaprabhu showed a little bit there in, in Puri, this Aishwarya. Because doing what is beyond capacity. When Krishna lifts Govardhan Hill, he doesn't manifest any other symptoms other than he usually does. And he's just simply standing beautifully. But Mahaprabhu, his body was being torn apart in all directions, and dislocated, and like going inside of his body. All of these are beyond human being. So Gurudev said, little difference is there in the sannyas lila of Mahaprabhu, sometimes showing like this. The Srila Sridhar Maharaj used the term, golden volcano of divine love. So in that book, there's actually a book Compiled from his, um, from Srila Sridhar Maharaj's uh, lectures on Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's life. So this book, uh, trans well, spoken in English, was, was compiled together in different chapters. And the first half of the book is like talking about Mahaprabhu's life and his preaching and his moods and everything like that. And the second part of the book, part two, is referring to his teachings, 
specifically seek Shastakam. You know that the last chapter, the final chapter of Chaitanya Charitamrita, Antya Lila, is titled Sikshastakam. This was the end when Mahaprabhu was in his conditions in the Gambira and Ramananda Roy and Sri Damodar Goswami were constantly with him day and night, day and night, day and night. And it was at that time that these eight verses manifested in the lotus mouth of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He also, in Krishnadas Kaviraj, in that chapter, he's also giving some little explanation of each one of those verses. You know, Mahaprabhu is stating the verse, and then he's talking about it. So, <clears throat> what Srila Sridhar Maharaj did in his darshans on this topic was he he expressed what he himself had personally understood and realized in his life on these eight verses. Those lectures were taken and put in this book. Now, the last chapter of this book uh, is on the topic of the eighth verse of Sikshastrakam. Now, the eighth verse of Sikshastrakam, we oldies, we used to learn it back then, but that verse, Ashlashyava Padaratam Tanashtumai. So that verse is what I'm going to read tonight, what Srila Srila Maharaj is expressing about this verse. Very special. Um, so, uh, the final chapter of this book and the purport that Srila Srila Maharaj speaks on the eighth verse of Sikshastakam. The title of this chapter is Union in Separation. Union and separation. So the verse is spoken by Mahaprabhu. Ash lishyava padaratam panashtumam adarshanam marmahatam kolotuva yata tata va vididhatu lumpato mat prananatastu sa eva na paraha. Gurve Gaur Chandraya, Radhikaya Itadalai, Krishnaya Krishna Bhaktaya, Tada Bhaktaya Namo Nama, Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda, Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Hare, Hare Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare. So the translation, <clears throat> of this eighth verse is as follows. Krishna may embrace me in love or trample me under his feet. He may break my heart by hiding himself from me. Let that debauchee do whatever he likes but he will always be the only Lord of my life. So the illumination, they call it, is uh, speaking the meaning of this illumination. Here Srila Sridhar Maharaj says, this is the greatest medicine for the devotees. This verse. It is the greatest medicine for the devotees. We have come to measure the immeasurable. This is what we've come to attempt to do. To measure the immeasurable. But we must always embrace this principle. In attempting to connect ourselves with the infinite Lord of love and beauty. In this attempt, 
to connect ourselves with the infinite Lord of love and beauty, we must remember, we must remember that He is the infinite. So what He's telling here, here we are, tiny finite beings, and now we're making this attempt to measure the immeasurable. But we always have to embrace this principle. What principle? What is told in this eighth verse. Uh, we, he, will, he will gradually reveal the meaning of these words. And he's saying, we are making this attempt to connect ourselves with the infinite Lord of love and beauty. The infinite Lord of love and beauty. But we must remember that He is the infinite. Now, He is only one to us. So to us, He is one. But He has many devotees like us to deal with. Right? Are we the only devotee? No. He's the infinite. And he has infinite devotees to deal with. But we only have one, him, from our side. He may embrace us with much affection and adoration, but we must be some kind of disappointment for us? That we must uh, be prepared for the opposite of this? Okay. He may embrace us with much affection and adoration, but we must be prepared for the opposite. Now how is this going to be the greatest medicine, as he told you? This is the greatest medicine for the devotees. Greatest. So, we may stick to his feet, holding on to his feet, but he may cruelly trample us. How does that sit with us? Wow. I don't like that. Mm -hmm. What is this? This is not justice. I'm trying to act to him in such a way and then he's responding in that way. Let's go on. This is very, very important. So, we may stick to his feet, but he may cruelly trample us. We have caught hold of his holy feet. We have caught hold of his holy feet, with great hope. Is it not? Is that not what we're trying to do? Holding on to his holy lotus feet and having so much hope? So with our whole heart, we are holding on to his lotus feet with great hope. Still, still, we may find that he tramples us and does not care for all our attempts and our affection. We may be giving our best and find that our offering is being fully dishonored. Look at the language Shri Maharaj is using. Huh? We may be giving our best and then find that our offering is being hatefully dishonored. He may embrace us. He may embrace us. But at the same time, we must be prepared that his dealings may be extremely cruel. What's all leading up to? Humility. The Leela of the separation of Radha and Krishna. 
let us pay close, close attention because this eighth verse is spoken by who? Shemati Radha. What we just told, this is spoken by Shimati Radha, by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who is feeling these moods of Shimati Radhika. When? Where? When Radha met Krishna at Kurukshetra. Okay? Very deep lesson here to be learned. In order for us to digest this, we will have to be fully surrendered. So, now it almost sounds up till now that there is a despotic personality here who does not care, but that's never the fact. So now let us go deeply along with Sri Sridhar Maharaj's deep realization. We may be giving our best, and we may find that our offering is being hatefully dishonored. He may embrace us, but at the same time, we must be prepared that his dealings may be extremely cruel. He may trample all our offerings beneath his feet, we must be prepared for both his adoration and his hateful negligence. We should be prepared for any adverse circumstances. Krishna may be indifferent. He may be indifferent. He may not care. And when he is punishing us, when he is punishing us, he is nearer. But when he is indifferent, it is even more intolerable than punishment. The devotee thinks, Krishna is ignoring me, neglecting me so much that he does not like to keep any connection with me. Doesn't he know me? Am I a foreigner unknown to him? We may accept punishment as a boon, but indifference is even more heart-rendering. The pain of separation felt by a devotee may even go a step higher. <clears throat> Krishna may affectionately embrace another right before our eyes, in front of our face, without caring even a little for us. We may think, this is my claim, my right. But that may be given to another right in front of our faces. That will be a source of increasing trouble to us. This is the law of affection. The law of love cannot tolerate indifference. It is too much to tolerate must be prepared for that. Must be prepared from the beginning that this is the meaning of Krishna praying, divine love for Krishna. Because, what's the reason for this? He is an autocrat. You know this term, autocrat? Hmm? What does that mean? Yes, absolute ruler, autocrat. There is no one to challenge his authority. He does what he wants to do. So we must be prepared from the beginning that this is the meaning of Krishna praying, divine love for Krishna, because he is an autocrat. He is love. He is love. Divine love means mercy and not justice. No. Divine love means mercy. There is no law there. And we have selected divine love to be our highest fortune. So we must be prepared 
to be treated without justice. There is no justice in divine love. It is free. It may flow anywhere and everywhere. This is the very nature of divine love. So we can't make any claim. We have no rights. This is the nature of the highest thing and is extremely rare. But unhesitating adherence to that principle is required from our side. It is and you must be prepared for that. In all adverse circumstances, this is the real nature of Krishna Prem. Die to live. You heard this three words before? This is repeated by Srila Sridhar Maharaj in many of his lectures. Die to live. What does it mean? What does die to live mean? It means everything that is now currently yours. Huh? You have to let that completely vanish, evaporate, die. If you want to live in the realm of the highest divine love, all of our demands, rights, justice, expectations, goodbye if you want to go there. In all adverse circumstances, this is the real nature of Krishna Prema, die to live. If you can accommodate all these different stages, good or bad, then you can enter this. Next section is titled Love Law. Love is above law. Now he says, Justice is within law. Is it not? We have laws. When someone breaks the law, then they're have to be punished and justice system is there of getting justice but that is there within the concept of law justice is within law then he says but mercy mercy is above law prema divine love is also above law, but it has its own law. Prema is above law, but it has its own law. So there's another verse whose meaning runs parallel to this one. It is given by Srila Rupa Goswami Prabhupada. The verse is as follows. You maybe heard this before. It's talking about a called a Chataka bird. And it's a poetical analogy given by Rupa Goswami to describe this relationship between ourselves and the infinite, Krishna. So, here's the verse. Virachaya mai dandam dina bandho dayamva gatiri hanabhavata kachidanya mamasti nipatatu shatakoti Nirbharam vana vambas tadapi kila payodha stuyate chatakena. Chatakena means the, the prayer of the chataka bird. Stuyate chatakena. So here is the translation and the explanation. There is a kind of a small bird named chataka that only drinks rainwater. Have you ever heard of this bird before? <laughs> uh, 
He, this bird is very small, and he only drinks rainwater. It never drinks any water from the earth, whether it is from a river or a fountain or a lake. Its very nature is that without, with its mouth upward, it hankers after rainwater. So Srila Rupa Goswami gives this example to show <clears throat> how a devotee should always be waiting in expectation of the rainwater of Krishna's love and no other love. Only that. So the devotee prays to the Lord, O oh Lord, you are the friend of the fallen. So I have some that you may grant your grace or severely punish me. In either case, I have no other alternative but to wholly surrender to your Lord's feet. So our attitude of surrender, it should be just like that of the Chataka bird who always has his eyes fixed upward, praying for rainwater. Rainwater may come profusely, only enough to fill up his small belly. Or it may be enough on his whole body. Thunder may come from above. A bolt from the blue may come and finish his small body, and send him to the non-existent quarter. But still, the nature of that bird is to pray exclusively for rainwater. He won't take water from any other place under any other circumstance. So our attitude toward Krishna should be like that. Whether or not he extends his gracious hand towards us, it is our duty to surrender unto him. It is our duty. In this connection, one verse comes to my memory. When Sri Krishna met Srimati Radharani and the gopis in Kurukshetra, after a long separation of perhaps a hundred years, he felt by separating himself from them. So approaching near to the gopis, and listen to this very carefully, I've, this is very unique what Srila Sridhar says. I've never heard this quite explained like this. So now when Krishna is meeting the gopis in Srimati Radharani and Kurukshetra, Krishna felt that he had committed a great crime. He felt by separating himself from them. And then approaching near to the gopis, especially Shimati Radharani, and remembering their qualities, their qualities of love and surrender, then he felt himself, Krishna, he felt himself to be like the greatest criminal. So much so, so much so, that he bent down to touch the lotus feet of Radharani. Now one poet has represented the scene in this way. And that poem has been collected by Rupa Goswami in his Padyavali. Krishna was at that time, he was the paramount king of India. Krishna was the king of India at that time. But when he came in connection with the gopis and with the atmosphere of Vrindavan, he felt like a criminal. And bending down, he was just about to touch the lotus feet of Radharani when Radharani, drawing back, she remarked, what are you doing? Why are you coming to touch my feet? This is astounding. Have you lost your mind? She said, you are the master 
of everything. No, ex no explanation can be demanded of you. Understand this point? She's telling to Krishna, what are you doing? You're coming to touch my feet? What? Have you lost your mind? You're the master of everything. There is no explanation that can be demanded of you. You are Swami. You are my husband and my master, and I am your maid servant. It may be that for some time you were engaged in some other quarter, but what's the harm in that? What is the fault in you for that? That does not matter, for that right is given to you by scripture and by society. There is no crime. There is no sin on your part. You have done nothing wrong. Then she said, Radharani said to Krishna, I am the real criminal. The meanness is with me. The defect is wholly with me. You are not responsible for our separation. So why that you are faulty or that you have committed some wrong? Proof that is that I sustain. I did not die from the pains of your separation. I am showing my face to the world, but I am not faithful to you. I could not approach the standard of faith which I should have maintained for your love. So I am the criminal, not you. It has been written in the scriptures by the saints that the wife should be thankful and exclusively devoted to the husband. This is still Shimati Radharani speaking. This has been ordained in the scriptures. A woman should be devoted exclusively to her husband, her Lord. So in this meeting, in this meeting, I should and beg your pardon that I have really no love for you. Radha Govinda Jyoti Jai. Is this not shocking what we're hearing so far? This is how Radharani actually felt, and this is how Krishna felt, and this is how Radharani responded. And then she goes on. I'm the real criminal. Why? Because I didn't die. And this proves that I have not real love for you. I am maintaining this body and I'm showing my face to society. I am not a proper partner for you. So please forgive me. You are begging my forgiveness? This is just the opposite of how things should be. What is this? Please don't do this. should be the ideal of our affection for Krishna. This is the ideal. We, the finite, should take this attitude towards the infinite. At any time, he may only give a little attention to us, but we should be all attentive towards him. And there is no alternative. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu advises that we have devotion towards Krishna and if we are insignificant, our attitude 
must be of this type. If we want such a great thing, then it is not an injustice that we should be treated hatefully. Our prospect, our understanding, and adjustment must be of that sacrifice and self-forgiveness. Just as when someone goes to fight for his country on the battlefield, there is no room for luxury or excessive desires. I remember in this connection that when Gandhi formed his non-violent army, one of the volunteer soldiers asked, please arrange tea for us. Gandhi told him, the water of the river may be supplied to you, but no tea. If you are ready for that, then come forward. So if we want to connect ourselves with the Vrindavan Leela of Krishna, we can be conditions, no conditions. Then, understand the method recommended by Sriman Mahaprabhu, by Sriman Mahaprabhu, that humility greater than that of a blade of grass. Humility greater than that of a blade of grass. If we want to connect ourselves with the Vrindavan Leela of Krishna, we can make no conditions. We shall have to understand the method recommended by Sriman Mahaprabhu, humility greater than that of the blade of grass. There should be no complaint from our side. Not only in the external position of our present life, but even in eternal life. This is our situation. We're the finite. He's the infinite. That will never change. Be any complaint from our side. Utmost So, only in the external position of our present life, but even in eternal life, any complaint from our side should be carefully eliminated. And we must fully accept the ways of the Lord. Krishna may accept us or reject us. We have to take that risk. Only then, only then, only then may we make progress. In some way, in some way or other, if we can enter the group of Krishna's servitors, we will find that everyone has such a nature. Think about this. You're going to a place in Krishna's service amongst his servitors where every of these persons have this nature. And when they meet together, a group of Krishna's servitors, when they meet together, they will console each other in their respective groups. In different serving relationships, there are different sections of servitors of a similar nature. And they console each other with talk of Krishna, Krishna Kata. Therefore, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Mach chitta madgata prana bodayanta parasparam katayantas chamam nityam tushyanta ramanticha. These are from the four main verses of the whole Bhagavad Gita, right in the very middle of the 10th chapter of Bhagavad Gita. verses that contain the whole message of the So this first verse is what Krishna is saying. My devotees together 
they talk about me. My devotees mix together and they talk about me. They exchange thoughts that give consolation to their hearts. And they live as if this talk about me is their food. It gives them a high kind of pleasure. And they find that when they talk about me among themselves, they feel as if they are enjoying my presence. The next verse, Krishna is saying, Tesham evanukam partam aham agyana jam tamaha nashayam yatma bhavasto jnana dipena bhashvata. When sometimes the feeling of separation from me is very acute in my devotees, I suddenly appear before them and I quench their thirst for my company. So sweetness within pain, this is the next section. In this last verse of his Shikshastakam, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has given another very fine and high type of solace. And this has been confirmed by Krishadas Kaviraj Goswami, who has written the following. Krishadas Kaviraj, in his Chaitan Charitamrita, has written the following. Bahe Visha Jvalahoi Vitare Anandamoi Krishna Premar Adhuta Charita. He is saying, Krishadas Kaviraj, don't be afraid. Outwardly, you may feel a horrible pain of separation. But internally, you will feel an unparalleled type of rasa. The most pleasing feeling of joy or ecstasy. Externally, there may be pangs of separation, but internally, there is the greatest satisfaction. In this way, we are advised by the scriptures and our practical experience corroborates our faith in this subtle matter. There is one English poet. His name is Shelley. He has written the following. Our sincerest laughter with some pain is fraught. With some pain. Our sweetest songs are those of saddest thought. Our sweetest songs are those that tell of saddest thought. When we are reading an epic where there is cruel separation between the hero and the heroine, it is so sweet to us that although we shed tears, still we cannot leave the book. When we hear about the pangs of Sita Devi, how Ram Chandra banishes her and leaves her uncared for in the forest, although she is with child, this is very painful. We shed tears, but still we read on. There is sweetness. It is possible. So separation from Krishna is like that. The special characteristic of Krishna Prem is this. Listen carefully. This is the special characteristic of Krishna Prem. Externally, we feel extreme pain like lava. But internally, our heart is filled with some extraordinary ecstatic joy. 
This is what Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has given us. As much as we can catch the meaning of his instructions, we shall be prepared for that kind of life. This is the fair to go to Vrindavan. This is the fair, what you must pay for your fare, to go to Vrindavan. And when we are introduced to so many others like us, then our joy knows no bounds. When we meet others who have the same nature and the same mind as us, we get solace from them. We need not be afraid. In spite of all these things, we should think firmly that this is our home and we should want to go back to home, back to Godhead. We are not foreigners there. Here we are foreigners. Every man treats me in any way that he likes. But Vrindavan is most hopeful and is full of the highest prospect. It is the place of inner satisfaction. We aspire after that. We cannot but continue a home. What is real joy and ecstasy? What is real joy and ecstasy? We are not acquainted with that. This is our present trouble. This is our present trouble. That we're not acquainted what is real joy and ecstasy. Huh? Yet, as much as we progress in Krishna consciousness, we shall become conscious of a practical feeling of real joy and ecstasy, a beauty and charm. And in this way, we shall become more and more encouraged. The great devotee Yamunacharya, he has said, Yadavadhi mama chaita Krishna padara vinde nava nava rasadham yan udyatam rantam asit tadavadi batanari sangame smaryamane bhavati mukha vikara shushtu nishtivanam cha. What is the meaning? King Yamunacharya says, Before I came in touch with the Krishna love of Vrindavan, worldly pleasure was of much importance to me. But now, if any mundane taste comes in my memory, then my face becomes disfigured and hit at the thought. You understand this point? Talking about association with women. And he was in a position of so there was so much opportunity for sense enjoyment. He's saying, Yadavadi Mama Chaita Krishna Padara Vinde Nava Nava Rasa Dhamani. <laughs> Actually, in this verse, Srila Sridhar is not giving a very elaborate explanation. He's saying, since that time, that my consciousness became completely absorbed in the lotus feet of Krishna and every single moment, nava nava rasa, newer and newer and newer tastes of rasa and ecstasy are coming. So in the midst of this, when sometimes any previous attempts to enjoy, what happens? My lips curl in disgust and I spit. <laughs> So, if we get a slight taste of that ecstasy, then at once we come to the conclusion that there can be no comparison between that and any peace or pleasure here in this mundane world. And at the same time, once we are settled in that atmosphere, no pain can disturb or affect us in any way. There is another side also. Although we are advised to be prepared for... Has he not advised us so far? <laughs> yes. <clears throat> but he says, although we are advised to be prepared for painful... 
the fact is not so cruel in reality. Krishna says, Chapi Aham, I am always with my devotees. An exclusive devotee, Krishna is there like his shadow, always invisibly moving after him. This is the Lord's nature. Quoting from the verse in the story of Durvasa Muni and Ambarish Maharaj, or Durvasa, you know that story from Bhagavatam where he tried to destroy Ambarish Maharaj because he broke his ekadasi without permission? And then he sent this demon, and then the suitor son Chakra came and, and destroyed the demon and then started chasing after Durvasa. So Durvasa went to Lord Shiva. He went to Lord Brahma. He could not find shelter anywhere. Then he went to Lord Vishnu Narayan. And he fell at the feet of Lord Vishnu. And he said, please, please save me. Please save me. The Sudarshan Chakra is going to devour me. And what did the Lord say to him? And Srila Srinivas is saying, it is the nature of the Lord that what? Wherever there is a pure devotee, exclusive devotee, Krishna is there like his shadow, always invisibly moving after him. So therefore, the Lord responded to Durvasa and he said, Aham bhakta paradino ivadvija. Huh? The Lord tells Durvasa Muni, I am the slave I'm their slave. I have no freedom apart from their will. Because they are completely pure and devoted to me, my heart is controlled by them. And I reside always in their hearts. I am dependent only on my devotees, but even on the servants of my devotees. Even the servants of my devotees are dear to me. So, Krishna is not a sweet ball. <laughs> this is the title of the next section, that Krishna is not a sweet ball. We must be prepared for any favorable circumstances, but we must not be discouraged. Krishna is most affectionate. His care towards us is most acute and sincere. His affection towards us has no rival. Still, Sriman Mahaprabhu has given us a warning in this verse that you are coming to search after Krishna. Krishna is not a sweet ball from the market that you can purchase and finish so easily. You are trying to attain the highest of the high. So you must be prepared for anything. And at the same time, the devotees will come to us. The devotees of Krishna will come to us. They'll say to us, have no fear. Have no fear. We are all like you. So let us all walk together in a straight line. Don't be afraid. We are here. We are told that Krishna's devotees are even more sympathetic to us than Krishna himself. The solace of our life and our fortune is his devotees. And Krishna says, Mad bhaktanam chaye bhakta. One who is a servant of my servant, he is my real servant. So sadhu sangha, sadhu sangha, the association of saints, is the most important and valuable thing for us. To make our advancement, and to progress towards the infinite, our association is our guide. It is all important. We must stick to this conclusion. Sadhu Sangha, Sadhu Sangha, Sarva Shastri Khoi, Lava Matra Sadhu Sangha, Sarva Siddhi Hoi. The conclusion has been given in the scriptures that all perfection can be attained by the help of the saints. Good association is our greatest wealth in reaching the supreme goal. Mahaprabhu can give the conception 
of full-fledged theism. It is his grace, his sweet will, not the property of many. Krishna is an autocrat. He is the highest. And whomever he selects to receive his own wealth will get it. No one can raise the question of no taxation without representation. You know that saying in the beginning of the Revolutionary War in America? They told that to the British. No taxation without representation. So he's saying here, no one can raise this question. There is no room for that sort of slogan here. Uh -huh. It is Krishna's sweet will. It is his grace. It is his own wealth, not the property of many. So Krishna is an autocrat. He is the highest. And whomever he selects uh, to receive his own wealth, he will get it. If Krishna selects, that person will get it. So, in order to explain this for our benefit, Bhaktivinoda Thakur, taking himself as a fallen soul, he says, My position is that of a servant of Krishna, but I am devoid of Krishna. What am I? I am a slave of Krishna, a slave of the Lord, but I am devoid of my master. What an ironic thing this is. You can wail, you can repent, you can mourn, but all rights are reserved by him. And when you awaken to that higher stage of self-surrender, you will get that wealth. But still, we must conceive that Krishna is above all law. Otherwise, surrender is meaningless. Surrender huh? is meaningless if we're thinking that there has to be some uh, demand that we can have. But no, Krishna is above all law. We have to always remember this. Otherwise, surrender is meaningless. It is not conditional surrender. If we analyze the very basis of surrender, we must ask, where does surrender begin? In full surrender, there are no rights. And whenever any rights are established, then surrender becomes unnecessary. We cannot think, we must fight for our innate rights. Mm -hmm. To a certain extent, we may try for our rights in this world, but in Krishna's pastimes, this mentality has no place. No place. All rights reserved. Even the goddess of fortune, Lakshmi Devi, cannot enter there. What to speak of others? It is inconceivable. Krishna is not under any law, or he is not within anyone's fist. All rights reserved. Everything is his sweet will. But he is absolute good. That's the thing. Krishna is absolute good. And that is our solace. We cannot enter his domain as a matter of right. Even Lord Brahma, Lord Shiva, and Lakshmi Devi cannot enter there. But still, if we take the path chalked out by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, we can enter, and we can achieve a position there. It is so dear, so rare, so valuable, and desirable. We must look for the magnanimity of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, which is aspired for by Lord Brahma and Lord Shiva. They are praying for a drop of his mercy. But Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu brought that here in a flood. The drop of mercy that Lord Shiva and Lord Brahma are praying for, Mahaprabhu brought it here in a flood and inundated everyone with that nectar, a drop of which is rarely to be had or even thought of. So we must approach his mercy with such an attitude of hankering and expectation. His gift is so great and magnanimous. Who can understand it? So with two verses 
from Srimad Bhagavatam. I'm just going to end with this. More is there, but I'm going to end with this. There are two verses from Srimad Bhagavatam. One of these verses is from the mouth of Krishna himself. And then the next one is from the mouth of Uddhava. He takes us straight to that highest, eliminating so many external things. So Krishna is saying to Uddhava, O Uddhava, na tata me priyatama atma yonir na shankara na cha sankarsano na shrir naivatma cha yatabhava. This is Krishna's statement to Uddhava. O Uddhava, neither Brahma, nor Shiva, nor Baladev, nor Lakshmi, nor even my own self are as dear to me as you. So if Krishna is telling this to Uddhava, then what does Uddhava say? What's his view? When Uddhava goes to Vrindavan, and after Uddhava has associated with Krishna's gopis and Srimati Radhika, and then what is Uddhava's statement? In the realm below Vrindavan, Krishna has told here that, Uddhava, you're the most dear to me. Vrindavan of the gopis. Then what does he say? The gopis of Vrindavan. This is what Buddha is telling. The gopis of Vrindavan have given up the association of their husbands, sons, other family members who are very difficult to renounce. And they have given their religious principles to take shelter of the lotus feet of Krishna, which are sought after even by the Vedas. Oh, grant me the fortune to be born as a blade of grass in Vrindavan, so I may take the dust of those great souls upon my head. So the gradation of theism can be traced from Lord Brahma, the creator of the universe, to Krishna's intimate friend Uddhava in Dwarka. Uddhava takes us directly to Vrindavan to reveal the highest devotion, eliminating various prospects in our progressive march towards divinity. We have to march on. And of loving devotion, not mere formal devotion. So, I could go on, but because uh, we're finishing here, but I will complete this tomorrow in the class. Uh, this is actually the conclusion of Srila Sridhar Maharaj of the entire book. And there's so much more, so much more nectar. Is that book in the library? So much more nectar. We just began. This is only the beginning. So, um, what do we take from what we've heard today? Let's just reflect for a few minutes before we end our discussion tonight. What have we learned? from what Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has told in this eighth verse. There will be more about that in the coming pages. <clears throat> but so far, what have we learned? That we gotta be willing to accept the pain 
of separation in order to, uh, yeah. to, to get free. Anything more? Where's Surrender. Huh? Surrender. You want to say something about that? <laughs> we just have to fully surrender, like give up all our independence and just pick up the garbage. Like spiritual <laughs> slavery, pretty much. Whatever Master says, uh, slave will do. <laughs> Why would we want to become slaves? The nature of the soul. Oh. Oh, why? Externally, it may appear to be slavery or pain, but internally, the, the feeling of bliss is unmeasurable. Yeah. But when the gopis are feeling that pain of separation, that they're swimming in an ocean of bliss, are they or aren't they? Actually, they are. But externally, it feels like burning. That's why Krishna Skavaraj said, Vahire uh, Vishalajvai is like burning poison. But Bitare Anandamoy, internally, highest Ananda. Otherwise, why is Krishna wanting to become Srimati Radhika to taste that and experience that? Is Krishna a masochist? masochist? Uh -huh. <laughs> no, he's Rasaraj. <laughs> he wants to experience Mahabhav. Uh -huh. But the point is, and I just want to say this, that we have to understand this. This readiness, this willingness, hmm? Is, is, are you finished there? This willingness, this readiness. We have to be ready at any time to accept what Krishna has arranged. It may not be to our liking, but Krishna is all good. But he's infinite. He's infinite. It's not that we come and demand. We have to conceive of this, even from the viewpoint of tattva. What is reality? The reality is that and who is Krishna? We're tiny little finite. He's the absolute infinite. He's the autocrat. If someone does not accept that, then there can be no surrender. He is love. He is above the law. That's what he said. Yes, that's correct. Is that's, is this is the thing. The this is the thing that Krishna is love personified, but in that realm, there's no laws. It has its own laws. Not that we can demand. Surrender to Krishna is done without demand. Now, we may say that, well, there is some demand, because Mahaprabhu even said in the Sikshastakam, fourth verse, My dear Lord, I don't want nadanam na janam na sundarim kavitam va jagadisha kamai mama janmani janmanishvare bhavatad bhakti rahoi I don't want. I don't want wealth, dhanam. I don't want followers. I don't want to enjoy beautiful women. I don't want this even liberation even liberation because he says what I want is janmani janmani birth after birth he's not demanding that you have to liberate me from the cycle of birth and death no but the devotee is putting forward his his mood his hope his expectation to Krishna that Mama Janmani Janmani Shvare Bhavatad Bhaktir Ahoy Tukitvai. I want only this. Unalloyed, 
unalloyed. Ahoy tuki bhakti, causeless bhakti. I want that. This is in the stage of Madhyam Adhikar. This is in the stage of a ruchi that this fourth verse of Sikh Shastaka. So we have to be ready for actual surrender. So Srila Sridhar Maharaj, in his purport, what he's describing here about the eighth shloka of Sikh Shastaka, this is very, very high level. This is Shimati Radhika's own praying. Don't dare approach me to touch my feet as if you are a criminal. I am the criminal. Understand? There is no blame. Oh, why did you do that for so many years? But Krishna's feeling that I did wrong, and he's feeling very uh, repentant. But Srimati Radhika will not accept this. She will not accept that Krishna will come to her in an apology. Why? Because absolutely. You it is your right. You are my Lord. You are my Pranath. The Lord of my life. And you can do as you want. You can embrace me. You can trample me under your feet. You can make my heart break to see you with another gopi. But you are free completely to do anything and everything. Yata tata va vidadatu lampato. Even you are debauchi. But mat prananatas tu sa evanapara. You are my prananath. There is no other. Sa eva na paraha. No other. But this is very, very deep. Shil Maharaj is extracting. He's trying to bring this within our scope so that we can utilize this mood in our attempt to go forward in Krishna consciousness. So this is the nature of Srila Bhakti Rakshak Sridhar Maharaj's kata. It is very... Uh, uh, it is very self-examining, so always self-examining. Am I actually a devotee? Am I actually surrendering? What is the standard of surrender? All of these things he's making clear. So Jai, on this transcendental disappearance day of Sri Srila Bhakti Rakshak Sridhar Goswami Maharaj, I'm offering my unlimited dandavat pranams at his lotus feet and requesting that he will shower uh, drops of his divine mercy on all of us so that one day we can actually become real Vaishnavas. Gaur Jai Shri Guru Dev Shri Prabhupada Shri Bhakti Rakshak Shri Goswami Maharaj Ki Jai.